Hello, my name is Quentin Broussard. I'm an assistant professor of clinical sciences at Keck Graduate Institute, and today we will be discussing parenteral nutrition. The reason why it's important for us to discuss parenteral nutrition is that parenteral nutrition is one of our main modalities of nutrition. In addition to enteronutrition, which encompasses both tube feeding and oral feeding. It's important for us to know about parenteral nutrition because there are some patients who are unable to tolerate food via the GI tract or nutrition via the GI tract. And because of that, we may need to supply them with nutrition in another route, and that's where parenteral nutrition comes in. Our objectives today will be just to describe components of parenteral nutrition to identify indications for parenteral nutrition, to classify parenteral nutrition access routes, so what types of peripheral lines are there IV-wise and what types of central lines there are, recognize complications of parenteral nutrition, discuss compatibility, interaction, and administration issues associated with parenteral nutrition, and then once we get later on into the class before the midterm exam, we will prescribe appropriate parenteral nutrition formulas from scratch. So we do have a case. FM is a 57-year-old female, 5'5 and 55 kilos, presented at the emergency department with recurrent nausea and vomiting. She was diagnosed with Crohn's disease six months ago. Over the last two weeks, FM reports feeling weak as a result of poor oral intake secondary to her nausea and vomiting symptoms. Abdominal scan findings demonstrate a small bowel obstruction. A PIC line, right peripheral IV line, and nasal gastric tube are placed. Currently, FM's vitals are within normal limits. Case question number one, which type of nutrition is most appropriate for FM to receive? Oral nutrition? enteral nutrition or EN and for our purposes here whenever we say EN versus oral nutrition if both options are present assume that enteral nutrition is tube feeding. Peripheral parenteral nutrition or PPN and central parenteral nutrition CPN. For case question two when is it most appropriate for FM to receive the nutrition support modality selected in case question one? Immediately, within 24 to 48 hours, within seven days, or within 10 days? And question three, what is the most likely complication of the type of feeding selected in case question one? Abdominal distension, infection, metabolic bone disease, or nausea and vomiting? So after we go over parental nutrition today, you should be able to answer each of these questions confidently. So, Whenever we think about parenteral nutrition, we have to think about our nutrition basics that we discussed earlier on in the class. And the first thing um, goes with energy expenditure. So how much energy or how many calories is a patient going to actually need? And remember that consists of basal energy expenditure, any diet-induced thermogenesis that occurs, which is a very negligible part of a patient's nutrition regimen, but it's still important because it does have a little bit of percentage of our calories and any energy that's used for physical activity. And keep in mind that the requirements can be increased in sick or injured patients um, due to the fact that some may be undergoing a severe stress response that may increase their metabolism in some way, form, or fashion. It also may be decreased in certain patient populations as well. So whenever we're assessing these things, we obviously want to take a look at our different modalities for measuring energy expenditure, which include weight-based equations, which are the most common type of way that we will assess a patient's um, energy expenditure, and we've gone over those in the previous classes. Predictive equations, um, which are equations that have basically been customized in some form or fashion to a particular patient population, and there is a specific formula a lot of times with these predictive equations um, that factor in different parameters of the patient, such as height, weight, age, etc. And then we have our gold standard indirect calorimetry, um, which, as you see, an example of on the right here is whenever we measure a patient's carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange. And by that measurement of carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange, we can actually predict how much 
the patient actually needs in terms of their energy or their calories because carbon dioxide is basically a byproduct of the metabolism of our macronutrients, including carbohydrates, fat, and protein. So here are our weight-based equations again. These will be important for you to know. You see that they're bolded here. Um, but we did go over these previously in one of the previous recordings. But they're just here again for your reference because we will be using them whenever we do calculate out the nutrition needs of our patients. Going on to macronutrients and fluid that are more specific for our parenteral nutrition patients particularly. Um, so again, we do have protein requirements. These protein requirements actually do apply to both enteronutrition patients and parenteral nutrition patients. However, with parenteral nutrition patients, we do have the ability to customize the exact number um, of um, calories as well as protein, carbohydrates, and fat that we give patients. So again, this is a slide that is important to know, particularly the bolded portions here for healthy adults and for critically ill adults with BMI less than 30. For our fat requirements, um, there's no absolute recommendation for daily fat provision for typical enteral or dietary fat. Whenever we give patients IV nutrition, we will give fat via IV fat emulsion. And that can be provided by a variety of different products such as intralipid, clenolipid, small lipid, and omegavin. And each of these has their own different portion of fat content um, and what type of fat is basically making up the fat emulsion. For patients who receive fat emulsion, we typically should not exceed 2.5 grams per kilo in non-critically ill patients, and no more than one gram per kilo in critically ill patients. Um, part of the reason for this is fat emulsion actually has complications that are associated, particularly with infection. Um, when we give fat emulsion to patients, we actually increase the risk of fungemia and other types of infections and that can occur because fungus is actually associated with this fat or lipid emulsion. Typically, our IV infusion rate should be limited to 0.1 grams per kilo per hour. You see that that number is not bolded here. That is not a number that you would necessarily need to know off the top of your head. Um, there, however, in terms of criteria to hold IV fat emulsion, we typically hold fat emulsion for patients or do not give fat emulsion to patients who have elevated triglycerides because fat emulsion obviously is associated with hypertriglyceridemia because it is fat or lipid in, in um, base. So typically, if we see our patients go above 400 or above 500, and there's numbers that differ in the literature, depending on what that cutoff is, we will actually hold fat emulsion and then reassess a serum triglyceride level in typically two to three days um, after we get that initial elevated triglyceride level so that we can see whether or not we can give patients fat. And remember, fat is important to minimize the risk of essential fatty acid deficiency, which can result in um, things like dermatitis, um, rashes, as well as hair thinning and hair loss. We also watch out for fat emulsion whenever you have a patient with hemodynamic instability. So that is a mean arterial pressure less than 65. And if you remember how to calculate MAP, it's one third systolic plus two thirds diastolic or a systolic blood pressure less than 90. A lot of times with these patients, they may or may not have um, an infection that is related to causing that hemodynamic instability. And one thing that we think about is sepsis and septic shock. So basically um, an infection that leads to a profound um, immunologic and inflammatory response. And whenever we give fat emulsion, we're increasing our risk of infection. If your patient already has a potentially lethal infection such that it's lowering your blood pressure so much, we tend to hold fat emulsion for those patients at least at minimum initially typically for the first week or so. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of critical care guidelines because most of our septic and 
um, septic shock patients will actually be in the critical care or intensive care unit areas. Um, this um, holding parameter is mostly associated with soybean oil associated fat emulsion. So we will typically hold fat emulsion such as intralipid, which is probably the most common type of fat emulsion product that is out there. We will actually hold that um, particular um, type of fat emulsion if we see a patient in septic shock or other types of shock. And we'll, we'll do it for up to seven days or until that shock resolves, whichever occurs first. Um, with other products that you might see commonly, such as Smoth Lipid, you um, actually have less soybean oil in that product compared to the intralipid product. And soybean oil is important because soybean oil has actually um, data associated with it to show that it is pro-inflammatory. And whenever you already have an inflammatory process out there, we don't wanna make that process worse. Therefore, it's more appropriate for us to give another formulation that has less soybean oil in it, such as small lipid. And intralipid and small lipid are typically the two most common types of fat emulsion that are out there. In terms of our dextrose requirements, this is a slide that you've seen before, but we'll just go over it briefly again. In, um, in typical fashion for our parental nutrition patients, it takes at least 150 grams of dextrose or basically carbohydrate to support the normal body functions of the body, particularly those associated with the brain. Because remember that dextrose and carbohydrates are essentially associated with the production of ATP through glycolysis and other metabolic processes. So one thing that we do want to keep in mind is we do want to give patients minimal amount of dextrose. And sometimes there may be exceptions to the amount of dextrose we give them at minimum, um, particularly say if the patient is very small, um, say if they are you know, less than 50 kilos, for example, um, or if we have um, severe hyperglycemia or a hyperglycemic crisis like DKA or HHS. Typically with dextrose in a PN formulation, we typically start out at 150 grams or two to three grams per kilo, usually whichever is less, to minimize the risk of refeeding syndrome. And remember, refeeding syndrome is basically um, a process where a patient who has been starved or has not eaten um, for you know, a few days or a prolonged period of time may go through whenever their metabolic processes ramp up again. So if you haven't had a lot of carbohydrates or sugar and you start feeding them carbohydrates and sugar again, you start going through more glycolysis. Whenever you go through glycolysis, that actually will tap into your phosphorus um, stores that are in your body and convert ADP to ATP through the reaction that goes on there to basically add a phosphate group um, to ADP to make ATP. And as a result, we see electrolyte abnormalities as a result of that utilization, such as hypophosphatemia and other electrolyte abnormalities such as hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. And those are very important to know as a pharmacist um, because we will see those typically happen whenever we start giving a patient parental nutrition. So we wanna make sure that we are very cognizant of the electrolytes that we feed patients. Daily requirement for dextrose typically does not exceed five milligrams per kilo per minute. Um, that is an FYI number. That is not a number you necessarily need to know, um, but it may come up whenever you do practice with parenteral nutrition if you have certain types of software that tell you how much milligrams per kilo per minute um, you are actually infusing. And in some cases, some of the data actually says you can go all the way up to seven. We usually um, calculate dextrose last minute when we're doing a PN formula, and we'll talk more about that on um, the day where we prescribe parenteral nutrition formulas. Fluid requirements. So fluid requirements are very um, gray in terms of how much fluid we should actually give patients. And fluids are dependent on many different factors. Um, for neonatal and pediatric patients, there is a formula called the holiday seer formula or the holiday seer method, depending on where you read in terms of the literature. Um, that actually helped to determine the fluid requirements in neonatal and pediatric patients. But those are that's only one type of formula. There are many different 
types of formulas and different types of assessment in terms of fluids. Um, and we see that here with the adults. Um, you see here that I've provided a, you know, a many different ways that you can actually calculate adult fluid requirements. So they may be considered 30 to 40 mils per kilo. And this can be based on actual weight or ideal body weight, whichever is less. Um, though the weight that you use may, you know, differ depending on the data that you have available to you. Um, sometimes we might give just one mil per one kilocal ingested. So say if a patient is taking in 2,000 calories per day, we might recommend that they take in 2,000 milliliters a day. And that's personally the one that I like to use um, because I usually practice with critical, critically ill patients and critically ill patients typically are on a lot of other medications that have fluid associated with them. So that's usually the one I like to use, but it's not necessarily wrong to use any of the other, these other ones. Another one is 1,500 mils per meter square BSA. So it just depends on what your preference is. Um, as long as you're not gonna, you know, underdo or overdo your fluid requirements. And keep in mind that, you know, you as an, um, a likely a normal patient um, take in a varying amount of fluid each day. So it's not always hard and fast. It's not always black and white as to an exact amount of fluid. Sometimes it may come as a range and sometimes it may come as more of an exact number. Um, but just keep in mind that, you know, these are gray areas and you're not necessarily going to be um, expected to necessarily, um, you know, pinpoint which exact formula you need to use. Um, this comes with a little bit of experience. Uh, but I will generally say in most practices, the first two are generally the most commonly used from what I've seen in my practice. Um, though you may see other methods also for fluid requirements. Now, there may be times where you have to fluid restrict a patient, and that is also a very important thing to know about. With heart failure patients particularly, um, a lot of these patients if, who are predisposed to becoming fluid overloaded because they cannot produce enough cardiac output to push forward, typically a lot of times they are restricted in terms of their daily fluid intake on the inpatient or outpatient side. In terms of heart failure specifically, we typically recommend that patients take in no more than 1,500 mils to 2,000 milliliters a day. Um, and whenever you counsel patients who have heart failure out in the community or in the hospital setting before they get discharged, usually a doctor or you as the pharmacist may have that conversation with the patient um, because that will help promote the, you know, efficacy of the medications that they're getting for their heart failure, as well as minimizing the risk of complications such as pulmonary edema and other types of edema that may occur. In patients with end-stage liver disease, um, sorry, end-stage renal disease, it really depends. Um, for end-stage renal disease, a lot of these patients will be on dialysis because they're not able to properly urinate out their urine um, and or basically more or less their body fluid that we would normally eliminate um, going to the bathroom. And as a result of that, fluid accumulates, which requires these dialysis patients to typically on the outpatient side get dialysis every two to three days um, for hemodialysis. Um, so as a result, we may not want to overdo it on the amount of fluid that they're getting because if we overdo it, you have to keep in mind that they're going to be holding that fluid for two to three days. Um, there's no hard and fast numbers um, necessarily that I'm going to show you right now for this um, particular disease state. We'll talk about that a little more whenever we discuss the um, patients who have renal dysfunction um, PowerPoint, which will be later on in the second half of the course. Um, but just keep in mind that these patients may have their own fluid restrictions. Cirrhosis in end-stage liver disease is similar to end-stage renal disease in some ways, in that some of these patients actually are holding on to a lot of fluid, just like with heart failure also. Um, in this way, for end-stage liver disease and cirrhosis specifically, they may actually um, go through a process that is called third spacing. So that means that their fluid is not necessarily in the intravascular space anymore or in the cell anymore. 
it might actually mean that that fluid is in a, another space where it is not supposed to be, such as the peritoneal space. And that's actually why we see a lot of cirrhosis patients and end-stage liver disease patients actually present with ascites and, um, and a sarca. And what we see there is basically they are gathering fluid on their belly um, through a lot of different pathophysiological processes that occur um, with cirrhosis, one of them being the fact that the patient doesn't have enough albumin supply um, in their body because the liver is basically responsible for helping to provide maintenance of albumin levels in the body. And if your liver doesn't function well, you can't hold um, enough albumin or you're not able to make enough albumin in the body. And if you're not able to make enough albumin, albumin is like the magnet that keeps water in the vasculature. Um, it increases oncotic pressure within the vasculature to actually um, hold that fluid there. And when there's not enough albumin there in the body, it might leak out. So we have to take that in consideration whenever we have a cirrhotic patient or an end-stage liver disease patient. It doesn't necessarily mean that we always give them albumin per se. Um, we may give them albumin to start pulling some of that um, fluid off. Um, but there's no real, you know, fix for this, unfortunately, other than, you know, a modality such as liver transplant. Next, we'll talk about micronutrients. So micronutrients, remember, include electrolytes, trace elements, and vitamins. So our common nutrition electrolytes are sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and chloride. And each of them has its own set of salts that are provided um, within parenteral nutrition. So um, if you are giving sodium in a parenteral nutrition bag, you actually have three methods to provide it. You have sodium chloride, sodium acetate, and sodium phosphate, as you'll see whenever we start prescribing these parenteral nutrition formulas. Potassium, we also have a chloride and acetate and a phosphate formula. For calcium, we only use calcium gluconate for electrolytes versus calcium chloride or other types of calcium um, that are associated. And we'll kind of explain why in a future slide. Phosphorus, we provide as sodium or potassium phosphate. And it's important to note that phosphorus or phosphates come as um, millimole equivalents versus your sodium, your potassium, um, for example, that come as milli equivalents. So whenever we are factoring in how much actual sodium and potassium that a patient has, we actually have to do a conversion. And this is based off of stoichiometry, which you learned about in your general chemistry classes in undergrad. Um, but the general gist um, to make this easy for you, in terms of converting sodium phosphate millimoles to um, sodium milli equivalents is basically to multiply any sodium phosphate millimoles by 1.33. And that will give you the amount of sodium milli equivalents. It will only give you the amount of sodium milli equivalents. It will not give you necessarily a phosphate milli equivalent. We just use millimoles for phosphate. So keep that in mind. For potassium phosphate, whenever we do the conversion, we actually multiply by a factor of 1.47. So 10 millimoles of potassium phosphate, um, in terms of the potassium content of that, is actually 14.7 milliequivalents. And that's going to be important for us to know because whenever we give some of these um, IV solutions to patients, we have to keep in mind the rate that we can infuse some of these things at. And we'll talk a little bit more about that with our standard electrolyte management whenever we talk about the electrolyte disorders. One thing that's very important to note is that you may have potential precipitation with calcium um, if phosphorus is elevated and vice versa. Um, typically, you know, one rule that I like to use, and this is just a rule that is not necessarily grounded in complete science, um, but this is just one thing that I've typically seen in practice, is that if your millimoles of phosphorus total between your sodium and phosphate salts, plus your milliequivalents of calcium provided by calcium gluconate um, are equal to or um, greater than 40 per liter. So keep in mind that it's per liter of PN, so 1,000 milliliters of PN. Um, that might result in a precipitation event. So basically, 
this calcium and phosphorus are basically binding together and forming this you know solid precipitate which if we infuse into our patient can actually you know be very fatal and we do have ways to minimize this in regards to the amount of calcium and phosphorus that we put in the pan bags in terms of the limits that we have available and we also have other you know modalities that can fix or basically you know minimize the risk of this precipitation such as um, IV filters that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, even though that that formula is there, the gold standard to assess for our calcium FOSS is calcium phosphate curves, which we'll discuss on the next slide. We also have um, magnesium provided as magnesium sulfate in the PN bag and chloride, which is provided as sodium or potassium chloride. And keep in mind with all these electrolytes, the choice of salt will depend on what your you feel that your patient needs. And sometimes there's not always a concrete answer of how much salt that we're gonna to give to the patient as we'll see whenever we prescribe PN um, therapy. Going back to the concept though of calcium phosphate curves. This is an example of a calcium phosphate curve. So Travisol is an example of an amino acid. Um, they actually utilize um, calcium phosphate curves based on the amino acid formulation that is present. And there are many different factors that will actually influence calcium phosphate solubility. One of which is how much calcium and how much phosphate you actually have in the pee and bag. Another is the type of amino acid formula you have. So keeping that in mind, depending on how much calcium gluconate concentration you actually have in the bag in male equivalents per liter here, um, you actually see here that um, for Travisol specifically, if you go to 40, for example, and if you have that much calcium gluconate in your bag, 40 milliequivalents per liter, um, and then you compare that to say your phosphorus amount, for example, um, and let's say you have 20, what you actually do on this graph is you actually will plot the parallel lines of where these um, readings are at and where those lines intersect will actually tell you whether you are compatible or incompatible based off of that original amino acid formula. So in this example where we have 40 millicolents per liter of calcium and 20 of phosphate, um, that would actually end up in this zone, which we call the incompatibility zone. If you are in the compatib incompatibility zone, there's going to be a high likelihood that your calcium and phos phosphate are going to precipitate, and that's not going to be a good thing. We don't want that to happen. We ideally want to stay in the area that is basically um, not the incompatibility zone. Now, if you fall on the line, it's better a lot of times, a lot of clinicians will say to... Um, you know, wane on the side of caution and not administer that PN bag. You might want to decrease the amount of calcium or the amount of FOSS you have in that bag. And one solution that you can potentially do is to administer the calcium or the FOSS as a separate IV solution or an IV infusion on the side that is not going to be in that PN bag because we don't want that PN bag to precipitate because if that PN bag precipitates, um, what we will have to do is stop the PN bag, and a lot of times at a lot of hospital pharmacies, um, PN is only made once a day um, for um, convenience purposes um, and workload purposes. So we will tend not to um, try to um, give um, another PN bag that same day um, because your workload may not um, provide availability for that. You might not have, you know, people properly trained on the machines, um, or you may not have enough time, especially, you know, for example, if this happens over nine and it's on a night shift. So we obviously want to make sure that this is not going to happen. What are some factors that influence calcium and phosphate compatibility and calcium and phosphate solubility? One thing that helps calcium and phosphate solubility or compatibility is amino acid concentration. The higher the amino acid concentration, the better off you are. Um, something else that correlates also with this is the higher the dextrose concentration. So higher concentrations of amino acid concent um, concentration as well as dextrose concentration are better. 
So keep those things correlated together. Concentration or percentage is better. It also depends on your amino acid product composition. So depending on whatever the pH of that composition is and what the phosphorus content is. Um, as you see below here, the pH of the overall formulation lower is better. So the lower the pH of an amino acid product, you would think that basically that product would have better calcium phosphate compatibility. And that um, pH and phosphorus content of the base amino acid product will actually dictate how that baseline calcium phosphate curve actually looks. Um, so keep that in mind. Every amino acid product will have a different calcium phosphate curve, and that's very important to know um, whenever you are evaluating these in practice. So like pH, temperature is also better to be lower so it's better to be on the cooler side versus on the hotter side. Calcium phosphate concentration, as we kind of discussed on the last side, slide with the calcium phosphate curves is important. Calcium gluconate is the preferred calcium salt that we um, use for PN formulations. We do not use calcium chloride or other calcium salts because they have a higher risk of precipitation. Pretty much point blank. Um, in terms of calcium gluconate, it provides better solubility, and that is why we typically use it in PN bags. Um, in times of shortage, what I would generally recommend, um, if you do not have um, enough calcium, I would not recommend to put the cal calcium chloride in the bag by any stretch of the imagination because the compatibility may not necessarily be there. What you can actually do is administer um, your patient's calcium requirements on the side um, as an IV solution. We talked about pH and temperature. The last thing that's very important is the order of how you actually mix the different components of your PN. So like we mentioned before, PN has macronutrients and it has micronutrients. And it has you know dozens and dozens of different little components that are there. So whenever we are trying to minimize calcium and phosphate precipitation, um, what we do is we actually separate the times where we give the, or we, um, or we basically inject the phosphate salt in to the um, bag and the calcium salt. We will generally actually um, put phosphate salts in first. And the reason why is actually going back up to this top portion here where we talk about the amino acid product. Amino acid products have actually phosphorus in them, as well as other, other buffers and whatnot to promote a stable pH. And because that amino acid product already has phosphorus content in there, we don't want to put any calcium in there at first because there might not be enough fluid at that point of the compounding process to actually um, promote proper calcium phosphate solubility. So usually what we'll do is we'll still um, basically put just phos in the bag first. Um, and basically, as we fill up the PN bag with all of our other components to where we're practically at the end, then towards the end of the process, we'll actually add in the calcium gluconate. Because volume is something that also may sometimes precipitate um, us um, having precipitation from calcium and phosphate. Because remember, it is based on the concentration, and concentration is um, defined a solute over basically solvent or basically the amount of particles you have in a larger medium, which is the denominator. So we typically put phosphate in first and calcium in last, and that's very important to know. You don't want to put them in in the wrong order um, because that might increase your precipitation risk. There are different orders in which you can put things in with PN, and that might be institution specific depending on where you go, but generally FOSS toward the beginning, calcium toward the end, so that you minimize that precipitation risk. Here are standard electrolyte requirements. So we're going to use this slide a lot more whenever we start prescribing parenteral nutrition regimens. These numbers are not numbers that you need to know off the top of your head um, in terms of the standard daily requirements. 
Um, these will be provided to you if you ever need them on an exam or, or an assessment. But what I do want you to keep in mind that for each of these electrolytes that you have here is that these are standard daily requirements. These are not going to be the daily requirements for every single patient population. For example, you might have patients who are given, getting severely diuresed on loop diuretics, for example, and we know that one of the complications of loop diuretics is hypokalemia. So you may actually have patients who are on very, you know, high diuretic regimens um, actually need more calcium, I'm sorry, not more calcium, more potassium. Um, in other patients, for example, um, in stage renal disease patients, patients who are not able to eliminate electrolytes appropriately, you may actually need less than what your standard daily requirement is for a lot of the electrolytes that you see here, particularly with potassium, um, phosphorus, and magnesium. These patients tend to actually um, have a higher risk of over accumulating electrolytes because they're not able to eliminate them through their urine. And as a result, in patients who have renal disease, we actually see higher rates of hypermagnesemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hyperkalemia. Um, so those will be um, topics that we discuss later on in the course. Um, but just for right now, um, these are what the standard daily requirements are. Um, in terms of acetate and chloride salts, we usually um, um, give enough amount of each or um, one or the other, depending on what the patient's acid base status is. And ways that we assess that are through a serum bicarbonate level or a CO2 level, um, as well as an arterial blood gas. Um, which can be done on some patients, particularly those who are critically ill and um, requiring oxygen modalities. Daily trace element requirements. So these are also numbers that you don't need to know. Um, and this is a slide that you have seen before, but the one thing that I wanna point out on this slide is that again, um, iron is typically not in trace element formulations because it does promote cracking of fat emulsion whenever added to PN bags. Therefore, we usually tend to use formulations that don't have iron in them, except in times of shortage. Now, whenever we have been in shortage before, I will say um, from experience that um, formulations like Atom LN, when given as a three-in-one formulation with fat, um, did not have any precipitation that I had seen. And there was actually a survey um, that was actually put out by Aspen many years ago that asked basically a similar question. Have you seen any precipitation? And more or less um, all of the 100 plus respondents who responded to that survey who practice in areas of nutrition support um, basically said that this is not really clinically significant, but it is important for you to know. Um, otherwise, these are just the daily trace element requirements. You may need you know, more requirements um, or less requirements depending on your individual situations. So for example, if you have a patient that has um, hepatic elimination issues, such as T-belly greater than two, um, we might want to minimize the copper and manganese components um, of those PN bags. For patients who need increased wound healing, for example, zinc is very good at wound healing and we can actually give much more zinc than the typical two to five milligrams. We might give 10 milligrams, for example. So other trace element considerations. So usually what we have available in terms of the common ones for parenteral nutrition are trail mint, which is a newer product, and um, multi-trace five. Um, which has been basically the most common product up until around this time. Um, both of those are provided typically as one mil requirements, depending on if you have the concentrated version of multi-trace um, or the unconcentrated version, which may actually be a higher milliliter amount. So you always have to look to see um, on your product what is gonna be your typical daily amount for an adult patient. And again, we talked about Adamil in on the previous slide. Um, if you have patients who have um, hepatic elimination issues with T-belly greater than two, we'll typically reduce those trail mint and multi-trace element requirements down. Um, however, there's not you know, necessarily solid literature on how you go about doing that. Some people may give half of the requirement daily. Some people may give you know, a dose on the first day, a full dose, and maybe not give any extra after that. 
Um, some people may give, you know, their doses once a week. It's not very clear. So um, whenever we do dose these um, trace element formulations in um, future um, classes within this course, um, we're going to keep this concept in mind if the T belly is greater than two. Renal elimination, we mentioned before, zinc, selenium, chromium, specifically are renally eliminated, but these have lower concerns on renal failure um, because a lot of these patients will still either make urine, at least in enough an amount to eliminate these, or they may be getting dialyzed. And as a result um, of being dialyzed, these will be removed appropriately um, because they are um, small ions or small elements. Vitamins. We typically provide vitamins to patients all day, um, all patients daily, except if we're in a shortage, if a patient has a certain um, vitamin excess or hypervitaminosis. Our most common formulation in PN is multivitamin infusion, and that comes as MVI 12 or MVI 13, depending on if it has vitamin K or phytonatione in it. We typically provide this as 10 mils a day. This typically makes the PN bag appear yellow. So if you've heard of the concept of a banana bag before um, that we give to patients who have been drinking excessively, um, we actually will give a banana bag to those patients and um, the multivitamin um, formulation component is what makes those bags yellow. And it will actually make PN bags appear yellow also, especially those that are not um, mixed with fat emulsion, like two-in-one formulations. So now we're actually going to talk about how do we use parenteral nutrition in practice now that we've kind of, you know, added on to our knowledge of macronutrients and micronutrients in regards to PN therapy. So this algorithm kind of breaks things down in a very detailed form or fashion. Um, but what I want you to get from this algorithm really is that whenever we do a nutrition assessment and we determine whether or not the patient has a functional GI tract, if they do have a functional GI tract, a lot of times we will go with enteral nutrition. It's less riskier. Um, but if a patient does not have a functional GI tract for some reason, then in that case, we will go to parenteral nutrition. Um, and this is the route that we're going to go down today. So parenteral nutrition, or PN therapy, is also known as TPN or TNA. Um, TNA is total nutrient admixture. Um, TPN um, is total parenteral nutrition. TPN is all-encompassing of all parenteral nutrition. Um, you might hear people say that. Total nutrient admixture, which is another time you might hear in some areas, um, is typically considered um, a three-in-one formulation for the most part, but that's just an FYI. I don't necessarily require you to know that because most people will still refer to parental nutrition as PN or TPN. I personally prefer PN. Um, delivery of nutrients via IV line into the systemic circulation is basically what parenteral nutrition is. And we can do this in via two different line methods, peripheral parenteral nutrition or central parenteral nutrition, which are basically exactly what they sound like. Peripheral being um, administered by a peripheral line and central being administered by a central line. So peripheral parenteral nutrition is also known as PPN. So it's the delivery of nutrients via peripheral IV line. Um, alternatively, another line called a midline um, into systemic circulation. A lot of times whenever we give peripheral parenteral nutrition, we're giving it for a very, very short time. And the reason why is that peripheral parenteral nutrition is actually limited in terms of the osmolarity that we can actually give um, to our patients, which is a product of our macronutrients and mainly our electrolytes that we are giving. We cannot give more than 900 milliosmoles per liter due to risk of vein irritation and basically bursting veins. Um, because whenever we give something in a peripheral vein, if it has a high um, osmolarity or osmolality or what we also consider a high tonicity, it will irritate veins and it will basically cause veins to become inflamed and burst. And that's what thrombophlebitis essentially means, vein irritation. So we usually will give peripheral parental nutrition when we don't have a central line is basically what I want you to get from here. Um, and 
another thing is that because of this osmolarity limit, usually if you need to give patients their full nutritional requirements, you're having to give many, many liters of fluid um, to these patients because it is so diluted. Um, if you are giving about 2,000 milliliters of peripheral parental nutrition, a lot of times that will not provide more than typically around 800 to 1,000 calories per day. Um, which my former <laughs> or my mentor for nutrition support actually has compared to basically a few Snickers bars, if you actually think about it. Um, whenever you think about um, the amount of food that you're giving patients, it's not really adequate to give a lot of patients 800 to 1,000 calories per day. It's more appropriate to give them, you know, a lot of times more than a thousand calories a day from um, most of the patients that you'll see, particularly adult patients. So these are um, examples of peripheral lines. So you see here that they are, you know, injected at different sites in the periphery. So these can be in your hand um, that you see here. And what is done is that they will insert a needle here um, in the hand and then they will basically, you know, put the cannula in at the same time, tape, tape it down and take the needle out. And then you basically have a little cannula that is resting there um, so that you can attach an IV line to. And this, these concepts will basically, you know, trickle down into your um, IV administration of any IV medications also. You also have um, the type where they're, you know, not just in the hand, but they may be in the forearm. Um, it really depends on where that line is going to terminate. And a lot of times with these lines, they are just basically the cannula that's there. So they're not really going anywhere. You also have other types of catheters um, that are placed um, in patients for um, more longer term. One of the examples here is a midline catheter or a midline, as we mentioned on the previous slide. This midline here is actually not um, just a cannula, but it will actually um, be threaded into a peripheral vein that you see here on the arm and then threaded up to a point before it actually reaches the superior vena cava or the right atrial junction in the heart. That is what makes it a midline. Basically, a midline is basically somewhere between where it is inserted and the superior vena cava, but it doesn't reach the superior vena cava, which is very important to know. So like we mentioned earlier, the osmolarity of the PPN components is going to dictate how much um, macronutrient or electrolyte you can actually put into the PPN. Um, and these are basically the osmolarities per gram of each of these different components. A lot of times, a lot of um, computer softwares will actually do the calculation for you. I'm not going to require you to know the calculations in this class for that, um, but I will um, just expect that you have a knowledge of where to find this information if you ever need it. Usually, um, one thing to know is that fat emulsion is relatively benign whenever we are considering PPN um, osmolarity. And that's um, important to know because we can still administer fat via our peripheral line with an appropriate filter. Central parenteral nutrition is a bit different. So the way that central parenteral nutrition differs from peripheral is that central parenteral nutrition, the line is terminating in the superior vena cava or where the right atrial junction is. So central parenteral nutrition is also known as CPN. So we're giving the nutrients via a central IV line into systemic circulation, and this is our preferred route. Um, anytime that we have a patient who is not getting any other types of nutrition via oral or enteral modality, we will usually want to start central parenteral nutrition on them. But it does have the limitation in that obviously you need a central line for that, and these lines have to actually be placed by skilled health care providers. Many a time by a physician, but you might also have other um, specially trained nurses who can actually put these lines in because the tip of that line actually has to terminate in the superior vena cava. We usually use PN whenever it's going to be expected that the patient is not going to be able to tolerate PO intake for a while. 
um, in any form or fashion, whether that be, you know, poor GI tract. In some cases, um, we might also have other, you know, events where we might have patients on non-invasive um, respiratory modalities, particularly right now with COVID, um, such as high flow nasal cannula or BiPAP, where patients might not want to eat, or if they basically get taken off of their BiPAP or their high flow nasal cannula machines for too long, um, they might need to get intubated. And in those cases, we might also consider um, central parenteral nutrition for those patients as well. We have many different ways that we can give um, CPN or central parenteral nutrition. Um, the lines that you will need to know or be familiar with are subclavian, um, internal jugular, femoral, um, peripherally inserted central catheter, and implanted port. And again, because central parenteral nutrition is in the superior vena cava or terminating in the superior vena cava, which is our largest venous return in the body, as a result of that, it's very diluted um, for any type of medication or any other substance that is basically injected into the superior vena cava. And as a result of that large amount of dilution, we can actually um, give um, any amount of nutrition that we um, would like to a patient who's getting CPN. So we can give them their full nutritional requirements if you have a central line. Again, if you have a peripheral line, typically you won't be able to get more than 800 to 1,000 calories reliably without giving too much excessive fluid. So these are the lines that we had mentioned just now. So you have different you know, core veins or different large bore veins that you have in your body where we can actually insert central lines at. So um, one of those common ones is the internal jugular, which is found in the neck that you see here. Um, a line can be placed there. A line can also be placed in the chest, which is a subclavian. Um, one of the more longer term lines is called a peripherally inserted central catheter. So this is inserted like it is almost like a midline. However, like unlike a midline, you actually will have that line terminate on the superior vena cable right atrial junction. You also have um, another line called a femoral line. A lot of times, and this is just an FYI, a lot of times a femoral line is not a preferred route. If you can get a, an IJ or an internal jugular, a subclavian or a PIC. Femoral, we usually go with, um, usually last line because it's not as um, comfortable for the patient um, if they have a line in their leg, but it is still effective. Um, and keep in mind that all of these IV lines are basically routed up to the patient um, into um, the superior vena cava where it will terminate. And another important part about these central lines, as well as nasogastric tubes and other types of um, um, feeding tubes, is that the confirmation of the placement of that line has to be confirmed before you use it. And the way that we do that typically is via x-ray. Um, a lot of times x-ray will be used in practice to confirm the placement of lines or feeding tubes. Um, for feeding tubes specifically, there are some newer technologies that you might not necessarily need a chest x-ray for to confirm um, that placement, but a lot of hospitals will lay on the side of caution and still confirm them with a chest x-ray. And the radiologist or doctor who is basically reading that chest x-ray will be able to confirm in their chest x-ray report where the tip of that line is and if that line actually needs to be adjusted. And sometimes it may need to be adjusted a few centimeters. Sometimes it actually may be you know, in a completely incorrect place. And if it is a com in a completely incorrect place, such as, you know, our lungs, for example, um, infusing, you know, lots of nutrition directly into the lungs can be a problem um, that can result in mortality. Another type of central line that is common, particularly with chemotherapy patients, it are implanted ports. And these are more chronic IV access that you might see with particularly oncology or chemotherapy patients. Um, same concept basically goes here in that the um, line terminates in the superior vena cava or the right atrial junction. And this port is basically placed under the skin. The needle basically will get inserted 
um, into the port. And basically from there, that is basically where medication or nutrition can be delivered. They are also known sometimes as portacasts. What are our indications for parenteral nutrition? So the main concept that I want you to understand from this slide, hint, hint, star, star, is that parenteral nutrition is typically given to patients who do not have a functional GI tract. That is the main indication of why we have parenteral nutrition. There are some cases where we can only give a certain amount of nutrition with enteral nutrition that might not meet a patient's you know, nutritional requirements. And in those cases, we can give what is called supplementary parental nutrition. Though this is not given very often, um, we do give it to patients sometimes who cannot meet their needs via the GI tract traditionally. But the main thing is that if you do not have a functional GI tract, um, you may be a candidate for parental nutrition. So what are some of those potential indications of why? Um, if you have a small bowel resection, so patients who um, have um, different types of infections um, of the intra-abdominal area, um, depending on the extent of the in bowel infection, that bowel might become gangrenous from a lack of oxygen being supplied to that area, particularly if you're in sepsis or septic shock, and that actually might um, require a patient to receive a small bowel resection. Other cases where you might get a small bowel resection are things like trauma, for example, if that bowel is um, severely damaged. Um, small bowel resection um, can actually um, lead to a syndrome called short bowel syndrome, and this is where a patient may not have necessarily the same um, type of um, small intestine uh, anatomy and large intestine anatomy to be able to um, successfully facilitate the feeding of um, the full amount of enteral nutrition. So usually whenever you get a small bowel resection, a lot of patients will have to re-equilibrate to um, basically eating again if they are able to eat. And a lot of times our you know, bowels are pretty good at that, depending on how much of the bowel is remaining. And we'll talk about that more whenever we talk about GI surgeries later in the course. Um, but small bowel resections, short bowel syndrome are potential indications. Ileus is another indication, and this is not necessarily ileum, which is the area of the small intestine that refers to ileum. This is ileus. It's basically a slowing of the bowel to basically um, not moving or basically little or no peristalsis. And this can result um, through a variety of different ways. Um, most commonly ileus may be seen after surgery, um, particularly bowel surgeries where a patient um, may have had their bowel operated on and their bowel is kind of in shock. And as a result, ileus might result. Um, we also might see ileus from patients who are um, prolonged um, in bed. So if they're in bed for days or weeks at a time and they're not able to walk adequately or move around adequately, they may develop significant constipation and eventually ileus. Um, another reason patients might be on um, or may have ileus is because of um, opioid therapy. Remember, opioids cause constipation. And whenever you are constipated and are not able to go to the bathroom properly, you might be able to collect a large amount of stool that is there. And sometimes whenever you get too much stool um, and too much opioids, you actually might develop an ileus. Um, intractable nausea and vomiting and diarrhea if on enteral nutrition. We don't want to give those patients enteral nutrition anymore um, if they have nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, except for certain cases like pancreatitis, which we'll talk about later on in the course. Um, bowel obstruction, which is basically a clogging of the bowel in some way. Um, you might also hear these um, terms small bowel obstructions or SBOs. Um, basically, it is a clog in the GI tract where something cannot pass through. GI fistulae or fistula, fistula um, that is referring to a disconnection where there may be a leakage in your GI tract that may result in the leaking of nutritional contents out of the GI tract. Volvulus is another one where we might have twisting of the intestines, for example, which you actually see here on this scan on the right. This large mass here is actually a lot of twisted intestine that you see here. Um, and when intestines are twisted, that can actually be a medical emergency that um, needs to be um, rectified via emergency surgery. 
Um, because when you twist the intestine, not only do you not get things through, but you also are not able to deliver oxygen to that intestine. And that is um, a reason why valve may become ischemic and you might actually get things like small or large bowel sections. Chyleek or chylothorax or chylocystitis, um, these result a lot of times um, when you have a nick or a hole in your lymphatic system, your lymphatic system is a very silent system throughout the body um, where you basically have a lot of your immunological um, mediators floating around, but you also have nutritional components floating around. And what happens is sometimes the lymphatic system can be nicked by certain types of cancer, um, certain types of surgery like cardiothoracic surgery, anything that is involving the thorax or the chest. If a surgeon unknowingly nicks the lymphatic system, which is very hard, you know, to even see, um, in those cases, you might get a leaking of what is called chyle or basically a fluid called chyle that actually contains a lot of nutritional components that can basically nutritionally compromise a patient. And if you feed patients via the gut this way, it can actually leak out, which is not going to be the greatest thing. That's why we give these patients a lot of times PN or other formulas that may be um, compatible with Kyle leak. Severe pancreatitis, if they are not a candidate for enteral nutrition, we'll talk about this later on in the course. Cancer, if the patient is not a candidate for enteral nutrition, particularly those who are like, you know, severely nauseated and vomiting, a lot of times are going to be the cases that we see here. And then Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, if not a candidate for enteral nutrition, especially um, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, that is more diffuse. There are lots of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis patients that can tolerate normal oral feeding or enteral feeding. Um, it's only if it progresses to the point where they're not able to take it in. Then in those cases, they can get parental nutrition. What are the parental nutrition components? We've talked about a few of these already. So we talked about protein, dextrose, and lipids. The one point that I want to make with parental nutrition with lipids is that um, it's typically can be mixed with other PN components, and we call that a three-in-one formulation, where the dextrous amino acids and lipids are mixed together in one bag. Those actually require a special 1.2 micron filter um, to filter out possible um, um, bacteria, other particulate matter, and other things that may result from mixing. Anytime that you have fat emulsion, it is typically going to require at minimum a 1.2 micron filter, so keep that in mind. Um, if we have patients who get PN in a two-in-1 formulation, that is usually the dextrose and amino acid together in one bag. And whenever we're saying dextrose amino acid, we also are including all the typical micronutrients there, also the electrolytes. The same thing goes with three in one. If you have three in one, all the components are in one bag. If we have a two in one, it's dextrous amino acids, electrolytes, vitamins, and trace elements. The vitamins and trace elements are not shown in this little picture. Um, and then we have a separate bag for lipids that is basically transfused on its own. The thing to keep in mind here is that there's not necessarily a clinical reason why you would pick a three-in-one over a two-in-one particularly. Sometimes it might be out of convenience um, in regards to the amount of lines that you have. A three-in-one is convenient in the case that it um, actually um, will all get infused in one line. Two-in-ones require two lines, but um, may be a little bit on the cheaper side because you're only infusing one type of fat emulsion bag, which is typically a 50 gram bag for adults. Um, with the two-in-ones though, you do have to um, take um, and use two types of filters. You have to use a 0.22 micron filter for the two-in-one formulation. Um, the way to remember this is two, two, and two, two-in-one, two, two micron filter. Um, for the fat emulsion, you still need a 1.2 micron filter. A lot of times at hospitals, you will do one or the other, depending on what your hospital and your institution um, guidelines provide for. So it will either be three-in-one for all patients or two-in-one for all patients, um, except for obviously patients who do not, do not get fat emulsion because it has to be held. In those cases, those are automatically two-in-ones.
So these have micronutrients in them, as we mentioned before. We also may have other medications that are included in the PN bags. One of them is regular insulin, which we can give um, starting at um, a dosage of 10 units per 100 grams of dextrose, particularly in patients who already have predispo um, are predisposed to hyperglycemia or have diabetes. That's usually the patients that we put regular insulin in the bag for. Um, and this is very art-based because you might actually additionally provide um, basal insulin to these patients in the form of um, insulin denomir, insulin glargine, or insulin degladec, depending on what you have available in your formulary. We also have other medications that we can give. We can give proton pump inhibitors or um, H2 blockers in IV formulations um, as a convenience to put in these bags. Um, it is important to note that if you do have um, you know, one of these formulations in your PN bag that you should not be giving a separate um, medication or a formulation um, via IV push or IV um, intermittent infusion. So you shouldn't be giving them, you know, an oral PPI, an IV PPI on the side. You should only be giving one um, agent most of the time. We also have pre-mixed parenteral nutrition. So a lot of times parenteral nutrition is compounded um, based on individual needs, but we also have pre-mixed parenteral nutrition, which can also meet the needs of a majority of patients, but it might not necessarily meet the needs of all patients. So this can be used as an alternative to custom prescribed PN. Some hospitals have gone completely the route of using pre-mixed parenteral nutrition for convenience purposes. Um, Clinomix is the main type of premixed parental nutrition that exists. I just want you to know of its existence and that it can contain um, amino acids plus dextrose um, with or without electrolytes. So they have different formulations that are out there. They have Clinomix and Clinomix E. Clinomix E is the one that has electrolytes in the bag. You also have to add in um, you may add in electrolytes separately. You may also even add multivitamin and trace elements separately into these bags, assuming compatibility. Um, they do have many different concentrations that are out there. These concentrations are referring to the dextrose and protein concentration. The first number that you'll see here is the protein concentration on each of these um, concentrations. You do not need to know these for your exam purposes. I just want you to know that if you ever see these in practice, the first number is protein or amino acid concentration. And that is basically four, if, for example, for this first CPN concentration of 4.25 and 10, um, that is going to be 4.25% amino acid, um, which is basically 4.25 grams of amino acid per 100 mLs of solution, over 10% dextrose, which is 10% um, dextrose or 10 grams um, per 100 mils of dextrose. So if you have a liter bag, obviously you would multiply these numbers by 10 and get your resulting formula. Um, with these formulations, you can infuse lipids separately. There is another product called procalamine. Um, whenever I did my research on this product recently, um, it was recently discontinued, but I have seen it in practice um, used as um, a premixed PPN formulation. Mm -hmm. There are premixed clinomix formulations that also meet this build also um, that you see the concentrations for here. These concentrations basically for the PPN concentrations here don't exceed the 900 um, milliosmoles per liter that we learned about earlier. When do we start parenteral nutrition? So PN should only be initiated if EN is contraindicated or in the cases where EN is not providing enough nutrition to the patient and if a patient has been in PO for seven days. So you're like, Dr. Broussard, why are, you, why are we you know, starving our patients? What really we're looking for is to minimize the risk that we have associated with PN. One of the big complications of PN is infection. And a lot of times those infections will happen as a result of having a central line. Anytime that you um, have something new that is basically in your patient, like a line, you increase the patient's risk of infection. The same can be said for fat emulsion, um, which you see here in this right bag here. Um, this bag here looks like a three-in-one bag where they have all of the components of the PN in the actual bag, um, including the fat emulsion. 
And fat emulsion, as we mentioned before, leads to increased fungus or fungemia risk, um, blood infection with fungus involved. So we typically don't want to give our patients um, PN unless they've been NPO for seven days, assuming that they're actually well nourished. Now, if your patient is malnourished, which we talked about in the first class of this course, um, and they do not qualify for EN. In those cases, we give them PN immediately because the data has shown that there is basically benefit to giving PN immediately versus waiting. Remember that nutrition is our baseline and that we want to basically provide nutrition to patients who obviously need it. Um, so if they are malnourished, we need to feed them immediately. Um, a lot of times this will happen usually within 24 to 48 hours of a hospital stay, most of the time 24 hours, but it depends on your hospital and the ability of your hospital to be able to assess those patients. Um, so remember your typical malnutrition criteria. Um, there are many things that can, you know, basically predispose a patient to malnutrition, um, but some of the key ones are BMI less than 18, um, reduced energy intake that meets the criteria that you see here, or significant weight loss, particularly weight loss that is unintended. So if you have any of these things in addition to other factors um, to basically be considered malnourished, in those cases, we give PN immediately. We do not wait. For EN purposes, we usually can start feeding the gut as soon as it's feasible to feed the gut, which is usually pretty quickly. Um, but for PN, we want to wait to minimize that risk of infection and other complications. What are those other complications, you may ask, other than infection that we mentioned with the um, the um, addition of a central line. We might have improbator catheter positioning, which we mentioned that we're always going to confirm with chest x-ray. We have hyperglycemia and hypertriglyceridemia, which are similar to internal nutrition. We have infection risk, which we mentioned is a result of the fat emulsion, um, fungemia risk, as well as the central line being in a patient. There's much more risk of a central line infection um, as a result of a central line, then there is a peripheral line infection, um, you know, being a result of a peripheral line. These lines are constantly checked by nurses every day whenever you have a patient in the hospital. Um, but because that central line actually has needles and other things that terminate within the patient, um, that's obviously a problem. A lot of times the peripheral lines, as we see, except for the midline, will just basically have that more or less um, that little um, small little port at the end of the um, patient. Um, and that will, um, you know, the fact that there is no needle there will minimize risk of infection, but it doesn't mean that it's not completely minimized. Refeeding syndrome, anytime you feed someone who is malnourished and anybody that you feed basically with parental nutrition is probably gonna be malnourished because they've been in PO for seven days or they have um, already been malnourished. They may, you may see refeeding syndrome with those patients. PN associated liver disease is typically seen um, from chronic administration of PN therapy, particularly for PN therapy that's been given for months or weeks at a time. And usually this is as a result because the liver is constantly having to metabolize all of the nutrients that are you know being fed to the patient because um, they are being directly fed through IV 24/7. What we do for those patients sometimes is after about four weeks or 28 days or about a month, we will actually consider cycling the patient down. And what that means is instead of giving the PN over 24 hours, we're actually going to give it over a less period of time, like 20 hours, 16 hours, or even all the way down to 12 hours if the patient is really stable. This provides patient time to be off of PN and provides them the ability um, to basically be a little bit more mobile if they are able to be mobile and not have to carry a PN around with them. A lot of times we cycle um, in the night times, um, particularly for patients who are outpatient who need PN therapy uh, so that they can go about their normal activities during the day. Essential fatty acid deficiency can happen with PN. Um, keep in mind that a lot of our enteral nutrition formulas do include dietary or enteral fat in them. 
and as a result, we do get our fatty acids from those with enteral nutrition. But with parental nutrition, we have the option to hold fat, um, particularly if our triglycerides are elevated or if we have hemodynamic instability. So as a result, um, if you hold um, fat emulsion, a lot of times for greater than you know two weeks, we might start seeing signs of essential fatty acid deficiency, dermatitis, rashes, hair thinning, hair loss. Um, and that's something that you don't want a patient to experience. And that's why there are recommendations that typically say within seven to 10 days of starting um, parental nutrition, you should give them fat because at that point, the benefits outweigh the risk. You also may see metabolic bone disease as a result of PN therapy, and this is related to varying amounts of um, not only contamination, but varying amounts of um, calcium and vitamin D that may be provided to patients via PN therapy. Um, multivitamin doesn't always necessarily provide the highest amount of vitamin D, um, depending on the multivitamin formulation that you have available. Um, so, you know, in terms of weeks or months, or basically patients who require a chronic PN, we see metabolic bone disease mostly in those patients. We won't see it acutely. So keep in mind from this slide that a lot of um, the bottom um, complications are chronic in nature. Keep in mind the top ones are going to be more acute in nature. So PN associated liver disease, essential fatty acid deficiency, and metabolic bone disease are long-term or chronic complications from patients who are on PN for weeks or months at a time. These are just some examples of the types of labs that you can monitor for PN therapy. I'm not going to expect you to know this list. This is actually a good you know, reference that your textbook Piro actually provides in terms of what you have to monitor um, regularly. Usually at baseline, we typically will monitor weight, vital signs, serum electrolytes, glucose, albumin. We might monitor LFTs and renal function, fluid balance. Um, and we might get serial um, readings of each of these um, labs and um, other diagnostics periodically while the patient is on burn or nutrition. A lot of times we'll get, you know, electrolytes daily while they're in the hospital. Um, whenever a patient is, you know, chronically on PN, for example, they might get um, their labs drawn every week um, until they're stable and then it might go to once a month. This is a sample PN order form. We'll also have our own sample PN order form that we'll be using in this class, so stay tuned for that. And here are the references. Going back to the case, we had our 57-year-old female who came to the ED with nausea and vomiting. She was diagnosed with Crohn's disease six months ago, but over the last two weeks, she's been feeling weak as a result of poor or intake secondary to her nausea and vomiting, and abdominal scan dis demonstrates a small bowel obstruction, a thick line, right peripheral IV line, and a nasal gastric tube replaced, and vitals are within normal limits. So what is the most appropriate nutrition for FM to receive at this time? And the answer here is central parental nutrition. So if you remember from the last slide, um, we indicated that the patient had Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is not necessarily a direct indication to get PN immediately. You need to, you know, a lot of times not demonstrate that you can receive enough enteral or oral feeding. Um, but the small bowel obstruction is definitely an issue that we might want to consider our parental nutrition for. So the next question is, do we give peripheral parental nutrition or central parental nutrition? Remember that central parental nutrition is preferred because of no osmolarity limit on central parental nutrition because it is administered into the superior vena cava and diluted much down versus peripheral parental nutrition. Um, which we um, are limited by osmolarity. So before you even give central parental nutrition, you have to make sure that an IV line is in place. Um, that is a central IV line. And in this case, our central IV line is a PIC, a peripherally inserted central catheter, which is a central catheter inserted through the periphery and basically routed up into the superior, superior vena cava or right atrial junction. The next question is, what is when is it most appropriate for FM to receive the nutrition support modality selected in case question one? And the answer here is immediately, particularly whenever you have patients who have not been maintaining enough um, 
good nutritional status such as poor energy intake um, or a poor BMI um, or excessive weight loss over a period of time. That is basically, you know, some of the big things that will predispose patients to malnutrition. Disease states also do that. So the patient here had Crohn's disease, and that may be something that might predispose them. So we clearly see here with our patient that they do have um, malnutrition. And whenever you have malnutrition, whether it be internal nutrition or parental nutrition, we want to feed them immediately. If the patient was well nourished before they came in, um, in those cases, we would wait um, seven days before we actually feed them. What is the most likely complication to result as a result of the type of feeding that you chose in case question one? And the answer here is infection, um, particularly um, related to central lines or related to fat emulsion. Because um, remember, with fat emulsion, we can get fungemia. Abdominal distension is a complication of enteral nutrition. So remember, anytime that you feed the gut, um, you're going to get gut complications, so nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. We don't see those things typically with parenteral nutrition. We don't see abdominal distension with parenteral nutrition. Metabolic bone disease is typically a chronic complication from parenteral nutrition. So if this patient was receiving PN for weeks or months, we may see that occur. Um, nausea and vomiting, again, that is a GI adverse effect, and that typically happens with GI-related administration of nutrition, so oral feeding or um, enteral feeding through feeding tube. That is all I have for you for today. If you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. Have a great day.